Coast for this series, and the same was true in the fall series, is that we've partnered with the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef uh, to, um, to present this, this webinar series. Uh, in doing so, uh, we're testing uh, a few of their sustainability metrics. And if you haven't had a, an opportunity, I really encourage you to go to, to their website, uh, to their educational information and, and more detailed information on, uh, on their take on uh, beef sustainability, I should say our take. And the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture is a, a member of the, the round table. Um, but again, just uh, take an opportunity, if you would, to, to go to their uh, websites here that I have uh, listed on the, um, on, on the screen. Uh, it'd be easy enough to search as well. You can find their information. Uh, one thing that you can navigate to that, uh, that I found extremely uh, useful is uh, to, to walk through a self-assessment of sustainability. One thing I've mentioned in, in previous webinars, uh, as I've discussed, our partnership with the Roundtable is the fact that, that um, most of us that are involved in beef cattle production know that naturally there are a lot of things that we do uh, that, that most of it, all of us and, and our consumers would consider sustainable. And so uh, going through that self-assessment uh, could open your eyes to, to what you already do and what you can talk about uh, with your neighbors and folks in your community uh, and spread the word more widely if you have access to do that. Uh, it also opened your eyes to things that we can do better to, to um, be more sustainable as we think about it from the aspect of economic sustainability, environmental sustainability. Uh, I always like to think about generational sustainability, certainly uh, when we talk about this. So uh, even more specifically than that, within the U.S. Roundtable uh, for Sustainable Beef, I'd like to thank Golden State Foods and Nestle, uh, both uh, for stepping up to, to um, partner with us, uh, you know, in uh, evaluating those metrics that they have set uh, for uh, their sustainability goals. Also, even within that, I, I've mentioned uh, in a few other places, a, a couple other webinars um, prior to tonight, that uh, another interest of, of ours specifically within uh, UT Institute of Agriculture and the Animal Science Department here is to um, not only have a, a producer voice like there already is uh, in, in the round table and by way of that in the sustainability discussion, uh, but also to, um, to be in the mix as that uh, information and, and discussion unfolds uh, so that we can uh, have a better, I guess, idea of, of what uh, the industry and what uh, more uh, importantly, the, the consumer thinks about sustainability so that if there does become uh, more um, market pressure, or I should say more market drivers on uh, sustainably produced uh, beef, something that we can uh, verify, then uh, we'll have provided uh, you here as Tennessee uh, cow-calf producers, um, hopefully a, a competitive advantage uh, in a market uh, that does reward um, something that, that uh, is produced by the sustainability metrics. So all that, again, to say thank you to the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef and more specifically Golden State Foods and Nestle uh, for partnering with us on delivering this webinar here to you. A couple other things to remember, this is the webinar uh, platform of Zoom and, and not uh, the, the meeting platform. So we don't see your video and we don't hear your audio. Uh, there are several hundred folks on the, the uh, webinar live this evening. So uh, it would just be too difficult to, to manage all that. Um, but there are a couple of ways that you can interact with us tonight. I have an example of a poll question. You'll see a couple or a few of those as uh, we go throughout the presentation tonight, that'll flash up on your screen. Um, if you're watching this in the desktop application or on your phone, uh, if you're watching in, in a, a web browser, uh, you may not see that question. Don't worry about it. Uh, that's not how we're uh, keeping up with your attendance or, or your credit for uh, having uh, attended the, the webinar this evening. Uh, that's done by the survey that you'll uh, see whenever the, the webinar is ended or that you'll have automatically emailed to you um, 24 hours from the, the start here tonight. So you should see that survey tomorrow uh, if you don't take it this evening. That's how we do your, um, uh, your attendance, but definitely um, we would like to put this interaction of the poll questions in. So as Dr. Wallman goes through his presentation, he'll have an idea of um, you know, the broad scope of, of uh, concepts, I guess, that, that uh, we bring to uh, uh, the questions that, that uh, he, he'll present with us this evening. So it's just good for the interaction and, and uh, good for direction of the discussion. Also, if, uh, more um, directly, if you'd like to communicate with us, if you'd like to ask a question, you uh, should ha be able to find the Q&A box. Uh, if you'll click Q&A uh, somewhere on your toolbar, 
and you should be able to find it in the, in the, the Zoom platform and you'll be able to type your question directly in. I'll, that, or I'll moderate that this evening. Um, I'll look at those questions. There may be a few that I can answer or that uh, if you ask ahead of, of Dr. Lawman presenting that information, I'll click to answer live and uh, kind of uh, make you aware, I guess, that, that he's talking about that specific uh, topic uh, at that time. But then at the end during the Q&A uh, time uh, portion of our webinar, uh, then I'll, I'll be watching those questions, have a general idea of the questions you'd like to ask as a group, and I'll present those to, to Dave and uh, we'll have that discussion here at the end. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker um, for this evening, Dr. David Lawman, uh, works at Oklahoma State. He's a, a beef cattle specialist uh, and a state extension specialist for Oklahoma State University. Um, I'm not going to go into all the, the specific details of his career, uh, other than to tell you that uh, Dr. Lawman puts together a really, really neat presentation. Um, I was extremely excited, you know, first when I knew we were going to have another round of webinars and started thinking about speakers from across the country that, that we could invite. Uh, he was first on the list to, to hopefully get to, to present uh, here in the state of Tennessee um, virtually. I've uh, talked to, to Dr. Longman quite a bit and, and seen his presentations and uh, I always get something new out of them. So Dr. Longman's a little bit ahead of me uh, career-wise and it's somebody that, that I've certainly uh, looked up to and, and watched as I've uh, been trying to figure out how to be a good extension specialist. So um, you, I think you'll see, or I know you'll see uh, after hearing uh, Dave talk to us tonight, uh, why that is because he can assimilate just a, a really broad, broad scope of information into something we can use uh, to make management decisions uh, on our, our cow-calf herds and uh, specifically tonight talking about uh, how to fit to the, how cows can fit to our environment and imagine uh, a herd to, to fit to the environment they're in. So I'll quit carrying on too much about that, Dave, and, and turn it over to you. But uh, other than just to say, I really appreciate you um, putting the time into, uh, you know, compiling this presentation and being willing to, to present it to us this evening. Absolutely. Well, it's my pleasure and my honor to do that. And I appreciate the invitation. Um, Dr. Reinhardt, how, what are, what are you seeing? How am I doing? Let's see, I am seeing uh, your full slide set like the editor. If you'll hit the start and I'll let you know what we, oh, you're perfect right on good you bet actually i'm gonna need to switch it so i can look at the camera okay there we go okay wait actually we're seeing your presenter view now oh. i think if you go up to display settings and hit swap tell you what i'll do well and if you want to end it and drag it over to a different screen. Oh, that work okay. Let me, excuse me. Oh, that's quite all right. I'll, uh, I can do that right quick. Well. Yeah, it's not. Not going to do it now. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. I got to ask you while you're doing that, Dave, what's the weather like over there? It's pretty warm here today. It's beautiful, windy. Yeah. Uh, but really, yeah, it's been a, just a gorgeous weekend and week. So, yeah. all right. I think we're ready to go now. I'm not seeing it just yet. Okay. How are we doing? Looking good. We're on a presenter view right now. Perfect. Better? You bet. Let's get it. Okay. Well, I appreciate, again, the opportunity to present to you all here tonight. Um, you know, this is, uh, of course, I'm passionate about this subject. Uh, I think it's fascinating, uh, matching cows to your environment. It's also deep water can be very confusing and uh, you know sometimes what 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 my goal is tonight is to hopefully leave you 
uh, with some fundamental principles that you can make decisions that will help you make progress in the future and give you some confidence uh, in the process. So that's what we're gonna try to accomplish. I wanna acknowledge uh, my graduate students here listed. My, these are my current graduate students. Uh, I told Courtney earlier, we spent all morning out there at the, at the, the ranch uh, organizing, working on one of these studies. So we've been working on it in this area now uh, for about 10 years. And, and we have learned a lot. I'm gonna share some of that data with you here tonight. Uh, and um, I can tell you we've got a lot left to learn because I, actually when I started giving these kind of presentations, uh, you know, we have uncovered some things that uh, have convinced me that we were wrong originally. <laughs> so I guess that's what science is for and that's what it's all about. Courtney's going to share this first question, uh, poll question with you, and we we'll hope you would uh, take just a minute to provide some feedback. Yep, and you should see question one now on your screen. And the question is, what trait would you most like to improve in your operation related to cow efficiency? So you got a bunch of different choices there. Just which one would you like to improve most in your operation currently? And I do have a pretty good joke ready. You wanna hear it? Why not? Okay, what did, the, <laughs> um, what did the coach say to the cow? Over my head. <laughs> Get out there and give me 2%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard a coach say that before. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end and share results with you. I think that was most of them. Increase weaning weights. Wow, that's fascinating. So uh, we're definitely going to touch on that. Uh, this looks like a few people concerned about fertility, and then and then it really drops off quick. But strong preference for weaning weights. All right, very good. Thank you for doing that. Maybe. Uh, Seems like on Zoom, always when I switch the first slide, it takes just a minute. Okay, so let's just describe, uh, what, at least what I'm gonna do is give you my definition of what a good match is. And if you, if you uh, would like to, I'd invite you to uh, make comments uh, in, the, in the chat or Q&A relative to what your opinion is to what makes a, good, a cow that's a good match for your environment. So here's my definition quickly. Uh, I think uh, maybe this, uh, this is probably the most important thing and this really combines two different things. One is fertility and the other is longevity. And so if we can get a cow to calve early in the calving season every year for 12 years in a row, I think most of us would agree that's a very productive cow. Um, with a high level of fertility and you know 12 years means that she's gonna she's gonna be around until she's 14 years of age and so if you cover as a two-year-old so that would be tremendous uh, another really important criteria that seems to be increasing uh, in importance in our industry is cattle that are problem free and that definitely goes along with cow efficiency. In other words, you know, requires no extracurricular handling or medical treatment and highlight the medical treatment. So in other words, they can withstand the disease challenge that is present or presented in your operation. I also put a, a little tongue in cheek comment there about including the owner. In other words, uh, cattle that uh, are docile, relatively gentle and uh, you know, don't uh, don't make you practice your high jumping skills in the corral. Uh, low cost requires little supplemental feed in your grazing and management system. And that's one that we've been working uh, quite a bit on. Uh, and then adapt to your environmental stressors. And of course, that's going to be linked uh, to the first one there, wean a healthy calf uh, for 12 years in a row. 
because if they can't do that, they're probably not going to, if they can't adapt to the environmental stressors. In your country, there would be a lot more fescue, uh, which would, you know, restricts uh, uh, blood flow to the extremities and causes heat stress in the summertime, uh, humidity, perhaps parasites, again, the disease in your environment. So cattle that, uh, you know, you, you couldn't necessarily go purchase a, a set of cows in let's just say Montana or the state of Washington and bring to central Tennessee and just assume that they're going to get along fine and your fertility rate would stay high, weaning rate stay high and so on. You don't know. Now some of those cows will adapt well. Uh, but some of them will not. And so that's the advantage of putting pressure on your cattle from an environmental standpoint and over time selecting cattle that are a good match for your environment. Uh, here, I like to look at it this way. I would like to have a set of cows that gets too fleshy, too fat during the good forage production years, and that, but they're still able to thrive in the difficult years. Now, I don't know what it was like in 2011 and 12 in Tennessee, but here in Oklahoma, throughout most of Texas, uh, I mean, there it was a severe drought, but yet we had some cows in our operation uh, that fared really well through those tough years. Uh, we saw a lot of cows go to market and body condition score three and four. Uh, so, you know, if, if every year you're, well, on average, your cows come in in really good condition at weaning time, you know, that's probably uh, uh, important information that's trying to tell you something. And maybe, maybe what that means is you could increase the stocking rate on your place. And if you were to do that, now I'm not trying to encourage you to overgraze, but if you were to increase the stocking rate on a set of fleshy cows, what's going to happen? Well, they would, they would select a lower quality diet because there's more competition for the good parts, right, of the forage. And consequently, uh, over time, you would reduce uh, the body condition score in that set of cows. You could say just the opposite. If they're always thin at weaning or on average, their body condition score, let's say three and a half or four at weaning time, that's important information that's telling you something about the match of your cows to your environment. And probably it means that you, uh, you either need to adjust your calving season, uh, perhaps uh, select cattle with lower milk production, so on and so forth. Okay, and then here's my final part of a good match of an efficient cow in your environment. And as you know, we'd like to have the whole package, not just a fertile, easy fleshing, problem-free cow, We'd also like to have one that uh, can produce rock stars after weaning. In other words, cattle that have the capacity to gain on grass, convert in the fives, in other words, feed conversion in the feed yard, uh, five and a quarter to five and a half to one would be fantastic. Uh, gain four pounds a day or more, never need treated when they get to the feed yard or at any point throughout the finishing period. And then finally produce a large, high quality carcass. And if you have cattle that can do that, uh, then you, you probably got calves that if you were to sell them to the same buyer year after year after year, those calves are a, a set of calves that can uh, fill, fulfill that job description would build, improve your reputation as a producer of high quality, efficient, very productive cattle. We'd like to have the whole package. And today, thankfully, we have tools available now that we didn't have 20 years ago. And it's so we're getting closer and closer to be able to accomplish that. Okay, let's just take a minute here and then let's talk about the fertility piece uh, of the uh, cow efficiency um, landscape. So, um, Really, this is my list of uh, practical things that you can do. And I like to tell people, you know, start off by culling cows that, that come in open, uh, generally around weaning time, uh, because, you know, something went wrong there. And 
likely those cows were in either in poor body condition at the beginning of the breeding season, maybe they calved late in the calving season the previous year, and so therefore this year they, they calved late again, uh, and then they just didn't cycle in time to get uh, pregnant uh, while the bull was in there, assuming you had a limited breeding season. But I like to encourage people to resist the temptation to, I call it, artificially modify the environment. In other words, uh, to change something, spend more money, purchase more feed, uh, start feeding hay earlier. There's lots and lots of ways you can artificially modify the environment. Uh, but resist doing that for the purpose of avoiding reproductive failure. And I think a lot of beef producers really manage to some level of reproductive failure. You know, you wouldn't want to go in there and pull the rug out from under your cows and wind up with a 70% or 60% pregnancy rate. You know, that would be pretty hard on the pocketbook for two or three years in a row. However, I don't think there's anything wrong with a, an 85% uh, weaning rate, which you know, weaning rate includes all the cows that were exposed to the bulls the previous year, uh, and then following through the cows all the way through the breeding season, all the way through gestation, calving, and then uh, weaning a live calf uh, there the following year. So that would be a weaning rate. And, uh, you know, 85 to 90% weaning rate means that you are culling uh, cows that are telling you that they're not a very good match for your environment. Next thing, uh, how about keep only the early born heifers? You know, once again, that's information that's that's important and that uh, that early birth is telling you that things went well. Uh, previously, the cow was prepared to cycle. Uh, she was she had the capability of becoming pregnant when she was serviced either through artificial insemination or by the bull. And she was able to successfully carry that pregnancy all the way through, have a live calf, raise it all the way through the nursing period and so on. Uh, so keep only the early born heifers year after year after year will improve uh, your fertility rate in your cow herd. And then right behind that, keep only early bred heifers. If you have the opportunity to expose your heifers to a short breeding season, uh, some people here in Oklahoma consider 60 days a short breeding season, but I think over time we're learning that it's important to expose especially the virgin heifers to a short breeding season, meaning 45 days. I like to listen to Mr. Burke Tyker, who used to uh, write for Beef Magazine. Uh, just tremendous mind in terms of low input beef cattle production. Burke is of the mindset now, he's telling people and probably written in some of his recent Beef Magazine articles uh, that we should expose virgin heifers to only 30 days of breeding. So if you synchronize and AI those heifers, and then 21 days later, if they don't get pregnant to AI, 21 days later, they have another opportunity to become bred to the bull, uh, if you turn out a cleanup bull. So that gives that 30 day period, only gives that heifer two shots uh, of becoming, or opportunities to become pregnant. And I, and I think the philosophy there is don't spend a lot of money uh, making those heifers big and fat at the beginning of the breeding season, you know, maybe moderate, aim for uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of somewhere between that 55 and 65% of their expected mature weight. But if you don't spend a lot of money raising those, those heifers, um, you have the opportunity to market the open heifers at the end of that short breeding season or 30 days, 30, 45 days after when you could preg check. And that is your stalker operation. And it, uh, it should be a profitable stalker operation. The heifers that become pregnant in the short breeding season are the ones you want to keep. And you put those two things together, uh, you do that for 10 years in a row, keep the early born heifers, keep the early bred heifers, you're going to make some progress. 
Okay, and then last, uh, our, my genetics colleagues uh, always tell me that the best way to make genetic progress in a cow herd is through sire selection. And thankfully, uh, uh, we do have some tools available there. Uh, those probably uh, are, are gonna improve dramatically through genomics over the next few years. But right now, the best selection tools we have uh, for sire selection are the heifer pregnancy EPDs, which is available in about four different popular beef cattle breeds. Uh, uh, and then stayability, that one also is available in uh, maybe, maybe five different uh, breeds. And then sustained cow fertility, that one's unique to the Hereford breed. I'm going to talk about it here in just a minute. Uh, but uh, for example, stayability has been uh, let's see, it was developed by the Red Angus Association. I think they first published that in about 1995. Okay, so it's been around for a 25, uh, going a little over 25 years now, and they have made some progress in, in that breed in particular, uh, but the other breeds as well. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. The other thing, is I've got a bullet point here. It says buy or keep bulls out of cows that always calve early. Now, granted, I wish we could all, you could all raise your hands at the same, same time here, but it'd be interesting to know, I should have made this a, a quiz question or a, a poll question, Courtney, but uh, how many of you take the time to go look at the set of bulls and then pick out two or three of the bulls that you like and then tell, and of course, this is a week or two or maybe a month before the sale, right? And then tell the seed stock producer, now let's get in the truck and let's go see their mother. And I'd like to see the records on their mother's production. Okay. And, and I'll bet not very many of us go to that uh, amount of a trouble or effort to find bulls out of cows that have a tremendous fertility record. How could you go wrong if you were to do that? Keep the early born heifers, keep the early bred heifers, and then always select uh, sires for your herd that are superior uh, for heifer pregnancy, stability, or sustained cow fertility. Okay, this is really cool. Uh, the, the sustained cow fertility, it's the exact same concept as stayability. Uh, this was about, I think this press release, I don't see a date on here, but I think this press release was about, and it's been about four years ago now when they released this CPD. I may be off a year or two there, but it's been out just a short time now. But this, this EPD or genetic tool is just fantastic. Uh, same, but again, same concept with stability. The difference between the two is stability and red Angus Simmental and a few other breeds is that it's a, a, a six year EPD. So it maintains the success. A cow has to be successful uh, weaning calves every year uh, for year, I guess that would be year uh, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. And so uh, sustained cow fertility is through 12 years. And so the Hereford uh, uh, breed uh, uses the 12 year threshold. So she, so the more females out of a sire that weans calves every year for 10 years in a row, the calf is two, so 10 years in a row, by the time they get to 12, uh, the sires that still have cat, more cows, a higher percentage of females in the herd that can, that can get all the way through uh, the age of 12 and wean a calf or wean 10, 10 in a row, uh, their sustained cow fertility EPD continues to increase. Okay, so here's an example. These two bulls have over 270 daughters in production. Okay, one bull has had a, when I, when I pulled this off of their website, had a sustained cow fertility EPD of plus 39, okay? And these, this EPD is expressed in percentage units. The other bull you're seeing here, I'm not gonna tell you which is which, but the other bull has a sustained cow fertility of minus 6%. 
Well, you can do the math. What's what's the total difference in the percentages there? Well, it's it's 45 percent. Right. And so what does that tell you about the number of females that would be left? Let's say you have a thousand uh, daughters from each one of these bulls that calved this two year old successfully. And then you jump ahead 10 years when these females are 12 years old. Here's here's what you wind up with. Give, well, I said 100 in this example, I just said 1,000 a second ago, but given 100 two-year-old daughters each, the more fertile bull has probability of 45 more 12-year-old daughters still in the herd 10 years from now. How cool is that, right? This is um, an extreme example. I realized that uh, the uh, the 39 bull would be in the very top percentage of the Hereford breed. The minus six would be in the low percentage. So that's an extreme example, but you get the idea. Uh, and you can make tremendous progress with that tool. Okay, let's talk then uh, shift to a weaning weight discussion. Um, Justin, uh, Courtney, I assume all of the cows in Tennessee there are weaned calves like this. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. That's some of our kind of awesome. That's, that's the back end cattle. Probably, maybe you probably sent me this uh, photograph actually. Yeah, I just wanted to get you to have an average kind of <laughs> that's a, common that's a, type of cattle. Okay, yeah. I like it. Well, they're, they're they're you're doing better than we are in Oklahoma. That's a two year old, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and it is not it is not one of my my cows. I say my cow, Oklahoma State's cows. Hmm. That's kind of what we all dream about, right? and hope for. And it was really, uh, really amazing to see how many folks on the webinar tonight are interested in increasing weaning weight. So let's talk about that for a few minutes here. Um, so what creates more weaning weight in the first place? So, you know, let's just go through the list here and think about some things that might influence your weaning weight. So health, they're going to have to be healthy, you know, uh, calves that aren't very thrifty, uh, are not going to have a very good weaning weight if they're uh, under stress from disease. So free from disease, free from parasite stress, uh, minimal, uh, some of that adaptation or environmental stress we talked about, heat, humidity, cold, I threw cowboys in there, that can definitely be a source of stress. Uh, excellent forage quality and abundance. I, I mentioned uh, the 2011 where our weaning weights were probably 100 pounds lower that year uh, than the annual uh, or long-term average. You know, here's another obvious one, genetic potential for growth. We're gonna talk quite a bit about that here in just a few seconds. Uh, and, and certainly it can have an impact. And then cow size, you know, wouldn't you think that bigger cows wean bigger calves? Uh, there is a strong genetic correlation to weaning weight after all, and this is the Angus genetic correlation of cow size to weaning weight. It's 0.61, which is a strong genetic correlation. Justin, am I frozen? Maybe it doesn't matter. It does look like it, but I'm not sure. Okay. Well, as long as they can hear me. Yeah, you're still, your audio is still good. Okay. Uh, milk yield, uh, you know, it, it stands to reason that cows that give more milk should wean heavier calves. And we've discovered uh, in our, our research that on average, that, that tends to be true. So I'm gonna plug my camera, we'll see what happens. All right, so let's talk about each of those independently. Um, We've got, this is the uh, genetic trend for weaning weight on, in seven different breeds uh, that are turn out to be the most popular breeds in the country. And this is the latest graph like this the, that the Meat Animal Research Center folks put this together. Uh, and, and this is the latest one that I, I could find on weaning weight. Uh, but what, all I want you to see, I'm not interested in comparing the breeds here. What I want you to see and we could put the, the genetic trend for yearling weight here and basically see the same thing. And that is that, uh, you know, the industry has been in what I consider to be a never ending arms race 
for growth for over 50 years now. And, you know, I think the important question is, you know, what good does that do for your cows at home? And is, are there implications? Uh, so here is the uh, weaning weight for Charley and Angus bulls. And this is the phenotypic trend. So this is adjusted weaning weights in those two breeds. And I just wanted to kind of show you uh, what's going on in the industry uh, from that perspective. So here you've got uh, the black dots and the black trend line or the Angus breed, of course. And it's, it's interesting, you know, I, I just would, I guess, summarize this and say that, yep, it's still going up. Well, the EPD, as I just showed you, uh, the genetic trend, for weaning weight is increasing in the seed stock operations in all breeds. And certainly this says that the phenotype is going up also. The Charlet breed, uh, same deal. Those Charlet bulls are just a little bit heavier than the Angus bulls, not a lot, but a little bit. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the last two years, uh, there's pretty low or lower weaning weight. And that tends to pull the tail of this trend line down, right? So it'll be interesting. So in other words, it looks to me like uh, it, it is starting to stabilize. Now, you know, that if it does, if that continues over the next few years, that would tell me that uh, perhaps the genetic capacity of the cattle may be reaching uh, the limitations of the, of the environment, the ranching environment, the forage uh, resources and so on to produce more winning weight. We'll see what happens, but these two relatively low years have really pulled this down and, and it may, you know, in the next two or three years uh, they may bounce right back up to, to a higher level. So we'll see what happens, but uh, it's, it's interesting to consider that these winning weights may kind of be starting to slow down. There's other indication that that kind of thing may be going on. slide doesn't want to advance. There we go. So we published a paper here a couple just been about two years ago now uh, in the uh, it's the uh, what uh, Journal of Applied Animal Science. So uh, you can look it up if you're interested in it. But winning weight trends in the US beef cattle industry. I'm going to describe that to you here right quick. Uh, and I, you know, to me, this was another one of those things that we were not expecting was was uh, fascinating, I thought. And so I just assume that if the uh, genetic trend for winning weight and seed stock operations are going up, uh, the EPDs are going up, uh, or the cattle in the commercial side of the industry would be also. First thing we did was we looked at winning weights in four different uh, publicly available data sets. This one, uh, the first one in the red line is a standardized performance analysis. That's Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma herds primarily. Purple is Kansas Farm Management Association. Shaps is Cowherd uh, Appraisal Performance Software from North Dakota and primarily North Dakota herds, about 70 or 80 herds a year. And then this is the largest data set. This Bin Bin program is uh, based out of Minnesota, but they've got herds from Tennessee all the way out to Utah. Uh, in that data set. And they'll actually, their data sets will be, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 230 to 250 commercial operations every year. So what I've got here is a timeline. This goes up through 2016 when uh, some of these actually quit reporting this information, SPA in particular. Uh, but what you see here in the SPA data set, pretty flat with the exception of that really severe drought we experienced. Okay, Kansas, there was a slight improvement, uh, not, a, not a very big one, but a slight improvement in weaning weights in this data set. In Kansas, that's, that's again about 80 to 90 herds per year. Uh, and then uh, the commercial cow herds in North Dakota, pretty flat also, which again was a surprise. And then the large data set from uh, based out of Minnesota, flat. So this is what first got us started thinking about, we published this several years ago, but uh, uh, first got us thinking that, well, hmm, if the commercial cow-calf producers weaning weights are not going up, 
I'd be interested to know if your weaning weights are going up, but uh, they're in Tennessee. You know, what's going on? Why wouldn't they be going up like, like those in the seed stock industry? This is the Alabama Beef Cattle Improvement Association data. Uh, their weaning weights went up. The blue line is adjusted weaning weights. The gray line is non-adjusted weaning weights, uh, adjusted to 205 days. And you can see here that they basically level off. Now there's quite a bit of variation out here in these later years, uh, but they level off somewhere in the late 1990s uh, and stabilized with, again, with quite a bit of variation from year to year. Okay, and then the last data set on this topic was from the Superior Livestock Video Auction data. Uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Ken Odie there at Kansas State University. They're really good about uh, analyzing and publishing some of the pieces of the Superior data, and the Superior folks are really good to work with. So we uh, had a graduate student that took uh, that data, and we sorted out all of the sale lots for the months of sales that we thought would apply to a spring calving operation. And then we, and then we pared it down further to only sale lots that indicated that they were non weaned calves at delivery time. Okay, so that, that means they should have been balling calves. They were sorted off the mother and loaded onto the big truck. Uh, remember, how many, how many calves do you have to have to sell cattle on Superior? Well, you basically have to have a truck load, right? So, you know, if they're 500 pound calves, you got to have 100 calves. So that'll tell you something about uh, the size of operations here. You see in this data, the states that are represented here on this slide, we've got it, uh, she's got it broken out here, and this is projected delivery weight of those non winged sale lots. You can see that those projected delivery rates increased, increased, increased till about 2006 and then leveled off. And we've got them sorted. She's got them sorted here and implanted and not implanted, or in other words, sale lots indicated they were or were not implanted. And we're not too concerned about that here tonight, but I just want you to see, and this is a large data set, there'd be around a million cattle represented every year. Uh, in that data set from the northern part of the country in the northwest uh, mountain region. So once again, some indication uh, that the weaning weights have stabilized at least in the northern part of the country. Uh, really shocked to see, uh, kind of see this pattern. Now, if you go to the south, however, we get a very different answer. Okay, this is Arizona, Kansas, Missouri, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, uh, the Superior data. Uh, we, we sorted it exactly the same way, uh, projected delivery weights for non-weaned sale lots. And then again, they're divided and implanted and not implanted, but this is restricted to these states only, you see at the top of the slide. Now, so uh, weaning weights or projected delivery weight, at least in the Superior data set, it doesn't agree with the Alabama data set. It doesn't agree with the SPA data set from Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. Why they don't agree, I don't know. Uh, I just don't. I know this represents a lot of cattle and it's a really nice data set. So I have some confidence that, that you know, there this is accurate. Now, whether for example, there's differences in Alabama production system or genetics and so on. I don't know. I can't answer that. It's interesting to me that if you look at this portion of these graphs from the north part of the country, northern part, winning weights or projected delivery weights were increasing at about the same rate as the current rate of increase in the central and southern part of the country. Okay, so. Because of that, uh, we, we think that we're just catching up in the South. Now, we could be wrong about that, but uh, here you've got, you know, the same rate of increase. We anticipate that this will eventually begin to stabilize also. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts about why the two regions might differ like that, but uh, that's, that's my thought. The other thing that we've got some published data uh, from the same data set from Superior Livestock Video Auction 
is that the influence of Bos Indicus in the southern part of the country has declined. The influence of Angus genetics in the southern part of the country has increased substantially. And if you look at the genetic trends for growth in Brahmin influence cattle compared to the genetic trend for, for yearling weight growth in Angus cattle, the Angus breed, Angus breeders have been much more aggressive at selecting for growth. So that could explain some of this difference, but I'm sure it, it wouldn't explain it all. Okay, so take home on that section of this presentation that, you know, the genetic potential for growth continues. It's been going on now for over 50 years in the beef cattle industry. And I think it's time we start asking the question, you know, um, how does that influence the cow herd? There are stark differences among regions as I've just shown you, but you know, really these big data sets and what's going on are, are, are sort of irrelevant to you. Uh, what's important is what's going on at your place. And with good records, uh, you, can, you can draw those same kind of trend lines for your operation. You know, it's pretty easy to do, actually, and, and it's something you ought to be tracking, and I encourage you to be tracking. After all, you know, if there's no change in your weaning weights for 10 years in a row, and you've been selecting bulls in your operation with average or, or above average, now we know the average of those breeds weaning weight EPD is going up, right? So if you've just been selecting for the average EPD or sires with an average weaning weight EPD, your weaning weights ought to be going up if it's following that genetic trend. It's important to know what's going on on your place. Uh, aggressively in the Southern US, we talked about that. Uh, just realize that you, know, you, can, you can change your weaning weights by going in there and providing more expensive inputs. In other words, artificially modifying the environment. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, just creep feeding your calves, for example. Obviously, those weaning weights are going to go up. Uh, so that's, that's not what we're talking about here. I, I think it's uh, what we're interested in is a trend over time, assuming that your management is relatively consistent. Okay, so here's another indication that might suggest that the Perhaps the emphasis on increasing weaning weights, may, maybe it's time that we consider de-emphasizing that, right? Uh, this is the Kansas Farm Management Group's publication. You can get right to it on their website if you'd like to go look at it. It's a really good uh, series of papers. Uh, but uh, Dr. Uh, see, Kevin Pendle, I believe, is the first author on this particular paper. But what they did is they looked at a number of different operations uh, in this paper, commercial cow-calf operations, and they discovered that 63% of the variation between in profitability between low profit producers and high profit producers, 63% uh, of that variation to be explained by cost, and only 37% of the variation in their, in their profitability could be explained by more production. In other words, more calves weaned, a higher weaning weight, and so on. So that's kind of fascinating to me. Now, obviously, if you have a wreck in terms of fertility, it's going to be a lot bigger number than this. Uh, but if if we assume that most of these operations uh, weaning rate, for example, is somewhere in the mid to upper 80s, and in Kansas, actually, it ranges, uh, it, it generally ranges right around 88 to 89 percent. Uh, if most of those are in that range, then this suggests uh, that uh, perhaps there's, especially if weaning weights are not going up, uh, it's more profitable to try to uh, do something to control costs. And by the way, in this data set, the difference between the high profit producers and the low profit producers was $415 per cow. Incredible uh, difference in profitability. Okay, 
Courtney, here's our next question. Yeah, I'm gonna get it pulled real quick. Okay. While she's getting that up, Dave, I'll say there's some really neat questions coming in. Um, and I'll, you know, we'll have a good discussion, I think, here at the end. Outstanding. Uh, yeah, and, and some really basic questions, too. There's a, a really nice uh, range of things here to, to discuss, and okay. it'll be interesting. Outstanding. Thank you all for doing that. Courtney? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll probably give about 10 more seconds, but the question is just what is your cow herd's average mature weight? And that's talking about your five to eight years. Feral cows when they're in a body condition score of five and mid gestation or about weaning time. We have to compare apples to apples, right? If we're gonna do that, don't throw, don't throw your two-year-olds in on the average, right? They, they're, they are not representative of mature cow weight. So five to eight years would be considered a mature cow. We don't want to know what the body condition score eights weigh. Just get, you know, try to estimate your weights when they're in a body condition score five. And then when in mid gestation there or early, even early gestation at, at somewhere around uh, weaning time. So that fetus is not real big and, and uh, influencing the weight. Very cool. So How many times have you seen that answer, Dave? Many. They all weigh 1,200 pounds, right? <laughs> well, you know, it'd be really fun if some of you would go home and uh, if you've got a set of scales, I know a lot of you don't, uh, and and really look into this and see if you're right about that. That would be fascinating, 1,200. And some of you I know do. Uh, some, some folks are admitting that their cows are 1,500. Uh, that, that's, those are some, those are some big cows, but yeah, I, I think, uh, 20 some years ago when I was at the university of Missouri, I asked the same question to a group of producers that were meeting and the answer then Justin was they all weighed 1150. Everybody's cows weighed 1150, but that's, that's good. Thank you all for, for participating there. If that's true, if that is accurate on average, then the cows there, you know, aren't, uh, aren't terribly big in my in my humble opinion okay let's see if i can move on here once again my advance is hesitating they'll probably all add up here in just a second there we go okay so now Obviously, we're going to talk about cow size. Well, why all the fuss about this? And some you you can look at my old pictures here. This this champion apparently I don't know where it came from, but this was a champion in uh, Europe in 1835. And somebody do me a favor and type in an answer if you're willing to stick your neck out. Why were cattle so big in the early 1800s? Why were they so big? Uh, this is a uh, grand champion. This, this uh, steer actually was raised here at Oklahoma, Oklahoma A&M University in 1937, shown by Oklahoma A&M's herdsman. Uh, Justin, the name of this animal is uh, Osage Orange, which is, by the way, where the orange color here at Oklahoma State came from originally. Probably makes, good, uh, makes good fence posts if you get a chainsaw to get it right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Uh, and yes, and the hard as a rock, the 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 wood of sage orange. But um, anyway, big difference in We're getting some uh, answers here in the chat, Dave. If you want me to, yeah, sure. Do some of them. Yeah. Uh, some things like. Uh, because they had ox blood in them, uh, more pasture land, draft type animals, raised for fat. Okay. You know, a lot of uh, dual purpose uh, labor and meat. Yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, that would be my answer is that they were draft animals. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was more power in the, in the larger animals. Okay, well, the, you know, the reason this is uh, all the fuss about cow size is, you know, it, I mean, honestly, uh, cow weight is important when you market them at culling time, good body condition and cow weight brings you more, more income, right? At, 
cow culling time. Beyond that, cow size is simply a proxy for feed intake. So if your cows are 100 or 200 pounds heavier and you're running on the same ranching operation that your grandfather was, your cows are 200 pounds heavier, you probably ought to be running fewer cows if you have the same grazing management system. Uh, and I realize that a lot of you may have improved on that as well. Uh, but it does influence stocking rate because there is a pretty strong relationship between cow size and feed intake, which, which is common sense. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you would anticipate that larger cows would, should wean heavier calves. They're going to eat more, uh, but you'd hope they would wean heavier calves. Uh, and then also that probably you would think would carry on into post weaning growth and maybe your, you know, your reputation for quality feeder calves and so on. And then finally, carcass weight. Uh, we know that feed efficiency and carcass weight, well, and then, and then yield or dressing percent are the three big things that really drive, well, I guess we better throw marbling in there too, currently drive profitability in the finishing phase of the beef cattle industry. All right, so let's take a look then and see what's going on with cow weight. Across the country, a uh, couple of different breeds I'm gonna share with you, their genetic trend, uh, breeds that collect this data and report it in, in terms of an expected progeny difference or EPD from mature cow weight. And I'm not interested in you comparing the breeds here, but this is the Hereford breed over a lot of years. And what I want you to see is that it's gradually increasing over time. Okay, so uh, that little shorthorn steer, he was, he was way back here when cattle were selected for real small mature weight. Okay, and then we came out of that era and we went through what, uh, well, Dr. Bob Tadashek was our department. And he, he called it the second era of insanity, <laughs> which, apparently occurred when I was in high school and you couldn't see over the cattle. A lot of you will remember that era too. The taller, the better. Judging cattle was really easy during that time. Uh, but the industry has since moderated. And uh, now actually frame size of cattle on average has, has definitely stabilized and maybe in some cases even declined. But, weight is increasing. Mature cow weight continues to increase. Let me show you the genetic trend for mature cow weight in the Angus breed. And it's plotted here in the lighter colored uh, dots. And then above that is the genetic trend for yearling weight out through, this is out through 2018 uh, in the Angus breed. And, you know, it's you can see two things here. Number one, just like the Hereford breed, the Angus breed, the mature cow weights gradually increasing also. And secondly, you can see the strong relationship uh, between selection for growth or yearling weight and mature cow weight. They go hand in hand. So you're going to have to consciously uh, try to control mature cow weight if you're aggressively selecting for yearling weight or your cow weights are simply going to increase over time. Um, okay, so here's some genetic correlations. These are important in this discussion because uh, you see that weaning weight uh, is correlated to feed intake, at a relatively high genetic correlation there. Post weaning gain, even higher genetic correlation with feed intake at 0.61. And then there's that relationship I mentioned earlier between mature cow weight and weaning weight. Well, think about those three correlations for just a minute. And I'll ask you the question, what, what does that mean is going to happen over time if we select for nothing but weaning weight, if we select for nothing but post weaning gain, or if we select for nothing but mature cow weight? What's going to happen? Well, this is what's going to happen. Um, well, I guess I don't have it here yet, but in the absence of control for feed intake 
and cow size continued aggressive selection for growth will result in a bigger cows right bigger in terms of weight not frame size but weight and here's another good question for you now that we're <laughs> now that we're on that topic uh let's see if if i recall the uh uh hip height in the angus breed which they publish a cow height epd also and it's really really a nice tool but it's stabilized uh i believe i could be wrong about this but i think it was in the late 1980s early 1990s when we came out of that second era of insanity for the extreme frame size selection the industry realized that that was a mistake and we needed to get that under control since that time at least in the angus breed again the one the breed that reports that the height epd it's been stable um, and so if weight is going up but frame size is stable what's changing Somebody type that in the chat. What is it that's changing? Something's happening, right? Weight is going up. Justin, do you have some comments? Not just yet. There's a, uh, yeah, here's one, uh, more carcass weight, uh, body depth and length yep. and width. Yep, absolutely. I mean, uh, so we're selecting cattle for thickness, uh, volume spring of rib right uh so i guess i guess the question is if weights are going up frame size is not changing you know what's in there what's in that volume and thickness well i mean it's a combination of things but it's muscle it's visceral organ tissue in other words uh, all the all the organs um and so on so those things are going to drive or, or certainly be strongly related to feed intake. So back to my comment here, this slide, in the absence of control for feed intake and cow size, continued aggressive selection growth will result in bigger cows, bigger appetite. But so far, these genetic trends tell you what? They tell you that the industry has assumed that the value of increased growth, whether it's weaning weight growth or yearling weight growth, you know, post weaning or finishing phase or whatever, is more valuable uh, than the potential impact on cow cost, right? Does that make sense? It's either that the increase in that yearling weight growth is more valuable or it's that uh, we just don't know. We don't know what the cost to the cow is. It's probably a little bit of both. That would be how I would answer that question. Okay. Uh, and here, and here's, here's really the, uh, the evidence. This is the genetic trend for feed intake. Uh, Herford didn't start reporting this until uh, about early 2000s, but you can see there, again, I don't want you to compare the breeds. I just want you to see what's happening. And certainly uh, feed intake over time is gradually increasing in the beef cattle industry. Uh, but, you know, once again, we've got this tool now, these feed intake tools that we didn't used to have. And so now we can begin to put some control uh, on feed intake. So what, what to do uh, in terms of cow size? How can you make progress going forward? Uh, certainly, uh, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about the calf weaning weight to cow weight ratio, and that's a good place to start. You know, uh, I, I know one seed stock operation that has the goal uh, of 50%, every cow in their breed or in their herd uh, should wean a calf that's 50% of her body condition score five conditions, uh, body condition score five weight at weaning time 50 percent that's a good place to start um you can all so you know if you've got a 1600 pound cow that always weans a 300 pound calf it's kind of a no-brainer right that would be a cow with a really low weaning weight to cow weight ratio uh i'll have to count we'll have to figure out somebody do the math for me right quick and tell me what percentage that is but it's pretty low 
And so it'd be a good culling tool. Here's another way you can go about that through sire selection. So let's talk about that for just a little bit, especially with the more recent tools that we have now that we didn't used to have. Okay, so take a look at this graph. This is uh, cow weight versus yearling weight. And this is data from the Angus breed. And here on the x-axis down here, you've got mature cow weight EPD from minus 50 pounds up to 150 pounds. Then on the y-axis, I've got these bulls plotted uh, for the yearling weight EPD in pounds. Uh, and that ranges, let's see, I've got it ranging here from about 60 up to about 160. Uh, these are, uh, there's about 550 bulls or dots here representing relatively proven sires, sires that have uh, sired quite a few calves that have been registered. Okay, so where, if you're going to try to select for cattle with above average growth, but below average mature cow weight, where is the sweet spot on that graph? So right there's the breed average for mature cow weight, just a little bit under 50, right? So if you're gonna reduce mature cow weight uh, in the Angus breed, you'd probably like to be somewhere at least in the 50th uh, percentile or, or breed average. And you'd probably rather be below it, right? If you're gonna put some downward pressure on mature cow size. So anywhere from there to the left, if you're going to, but at the same time, if you're going to increase growth or at least maintain acceptable growth, right there is breed average for yearling weight. So I'm saying the sweet spot here is somewhere in that oval. Okay, this, these would be sires that would be expected to produce females that are are, uh, would put some downward pressure or moderate mature cow size, but yet be breed average or above breed average in growth. Now, to me, this is kind of the new, uh, or at least an opportunity for a new era of uh, curve benders in the beef cattle industry. So what have, we, what have we been talking about for the last 20 years in terms of curve benders? Well, it's bulls that are low, in birth weight, but really high in growth, right? Those are curve benders. Now we use calving ease direct EPD more than we do the birth weight EPD, but you get, you get the picture. And I'll tell you, our industry has knocked it out of the park on that. When I was, I was responsible for calving the heifers, Justin in Montana, uh, when I was the herdsman up there and working on my master's degree. And I'm telling you that back then, it's been quite a while back now, but uh, back then it, it was a disaster. Uh, not, not that their operation was a disaster, but we had to pull a lot more calves back in those days, uh, especially if you use sires with any kind of growth uh, genetics at all. Now, bulls with a really high calving ease direct, in other words, should be a calving ease bull, low birth weight EPD, but 150 and Angus, Angus EPD is 150, uh, 140 yearling weight EPD. I mean, they're everywhere, 130 maybe, okay? But a, well above breed average, they're everywhere. And you can fix that problem, uh, you know, without a lot of effort now, just by using a, a sire that is calving ease, but yet has acceptable growth. We can do the same for cow weight. There's not very many bulls here, but 25, 30 years ago, there weren't very many bulls with high calving ease and high growth. Uh, we can do the same uh, in terms of cow weight, keeping our cow cap costs down on the ranch uh, and also at the same time, continuing to maintain uh, tremendous post weaning performance. Another question relative to cow size, I mean, how big do they need to be to create a good size carcass, okay? And so I'm just gonna show you some of our data from our cow herd here at Oklahoma State. Uh, we finish we finished our own, our calves. Uh, actually, we finished these cattle at a, at a 
uh, feed yard in Colorado. Uh, and I, let me just show you our cows when they're in a body condition score five at weaning, uh, five to eight years of age away. Oh, in the neighborhood of 11, probably 1150 to 1175. And yes, we know that because we weigh them all the time. Uh, but somewhere in that 11, we'll, we'll just say 1175. Now, this is just a, a picture uh, a scan of a, we call it a kill sheet on the day that these cattle were sold. This is a little group of uh, the tail end of fall born calves. Okay, Travis is the feed yard manager. Travis scanned this after he jotted down on the sheet what those cattle weighed that morning. And this was what, January 12th, 2019. Travis said these calves this morning weighed 1525. They always want to take 4% of your pay weight to calculate the pay weight, uh, pay weight of 1464. Okay, finished steers at 1464 pounds. Uh, easily these carcasses are uh, over 900 pounds. So I'm just saying, you know, with 1175 pound cows, the technology we have available today through the cattle feeding industry, why would we need bigger cows to produce an acceptable size, even a large carcass? This is the next year. This is actually the next summer. These are our springborn calves. Travis sends me a text here on, uh, let's see, this is Friday. Nope, this is about Wednesday, apparently. He says cattle are shipping Friday at 8.30 a.m. And this, this was another little tail end group. I said, sounds good. Then Friday morning rolls around, I get a text from Travis again. He says, 1600 yard pay weight, or sorry, weight, 1536 pay weight, after you subtract the 4%, there's 31 heads in that little group. This is my favorite part of this, of his message. He says, we could not weigh four head too big for the shoot, Travis. <laughs> so, so once again, uh, these are out of those 1175 pound cows. Um, and these, these happen to be Charlet, uh, terminal sired Charlet steers. And with the technology we've got today and implants and uh, improved uh, finishing rations and so on, uh, we can create, I mean, these carcasses will easily be over 920 pound carcasses on average. Just tremendous production capacity in the beef cattle industry today without having to have big cows. All right, kind of the last big issue I want to talk to you about in terms of improving your match is this, is this conversation about milk production. Now, I know you all have had some discussion about that over the last few years when uh, Dr. Mullenix was there in Tennessee and did some of this work, but I think it's important that we revisit it. Uh, the industry is changing. Uh, when I started paying attention to genetic potential for milk, in the industry uh, several years ago, we were headed straight north in selecting, aggressively selecting for milk yield and beef cows. We have a cow herd that I inherited here about four years ago here at Oklahoma State, uh, had not been intentionally selected for high milk production. My grad students all know if they come to work for me, we're going to milk beef cows. Uh, and so we use a milking machine. Uh, it's a portable milking machine. We have two chutes set up at each one of our facilities, and we're milking two cows at the same time. Um, and yes, yep, we've, we've had a few trips to the emergency room, but you'd be surprised. They gentle down pretty quick. After you've milked cows two or three times, you handle them quiet and gentle, uh, they settle down. But let me show you what we've learned. Here's So this is one the set of cows, spring calvers that I inherited several years ago now. Uh, four years in a row, we milk these cows uh, every month. This is the peak lactation yield in May when our forage quality here in Oklahoma is as good as it's going to get, primarily native rangeland. Okay, now these cows produced consistently around 30 to 33 pounds of milk at peak lactation. Now, if you go back and look at the Bible for beef cattle nutrition, the national, we used to call it the National Research Council. 
book on beef cattle nutrition. Now we call it the National Academy of Sciences. Regardless, it still considers the average production on a commercial cow to be somewhere in the range of about 25 pounds, 20 to 25 pounds, okay? And I can tell you that this cow herd, our spring calving cow herd, that was not intentionally selected for high milk production, just kind of average Angus cows, uh, produces a lot more than 20 or 25 pounds a day. And so there's probably quite a few herds out in the industry that have gotten to this point, and maybe just don't realize it. But uh, at the same time, this cow herd is, they're kind of, they're a little bit larger frame cows and they're a little bit hard keeping, okay? They're not what I consider to be a set of easy fleshing cows. Okay, now, uh, if how do you know then what to select in terms of sires for uh, a range in milk EPD or expected progeny difference? Uh, I, I think this is a really good tool. The Angus Association provides it. Uh, you can go, you can just Google the Angus Optimal Milk Module and, and you'll get to it really quick. And I encourage you to go play and explore with this tool. I entered, looks like I entered 1,150 pounds for our cows. I said uh, medium pasture and feed costs uh, at $385 a year. And then feed variability, extremely variable because we have severe drought here in Oklahoma every few years. And when I put plug those in, it spits out, tells me that I need to be going selecting bulls in the Angus breed somewhere between about 15 to 19 pounds of milk EPD. And actually, based on the research we've done so far, I think that's, I think that's pretty accurate. Let me show you why I think it's a mistake uh, to continue to select for a lot more milk in a beef cow, hoping that we're going to increase profitability. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to do that by showing you one, a couple of experiments on the same graph here. Now, I don't want you to worry about the, the units here. They're kind of confusing units, but just know that each one of these dots, as you move to the right, the cows are getting more total energy. So the researchers are controlling energy and these cows aren't getting a lot. They're probably losing weight. These cows are getting quite a bit more. These cows clear over here on the right started getting nearly 30 pounds of what would be about a 70% TDN diet. So a lot of a high quality total mixed ration uh, would also be real similar to your real lush spring forage quality over here on the far right. Then over on the, on the y-axis here, you can see milk yield in hundred days. So if you wanna divide that by hundred, you can see what the average milk yield was done. Now these projects were done in mid and late lactation not peak milk yield uh, early on. So these values aren't gonna be as high as what I showed you in the previous slide. However, let me show you what, what's going on. We're talking about a study that was published here in 1992. These are the Angus cows uh, from about 1990. They would, have been, they would have been probably born actually in the late 1980s. Uh, the, every time you increase energy intake, and this set of Angus cows, the Meat Animal Research Center back in the, in the 1990s, milk yield increased, right? Cows are sensitive to the immediate availability of nutrition. Any dairy producer would, would uh, tell you the same thing. Okay, now, what happened if you had a set of cows with lower genetic potential for milk and you increase the environmental uh, uh, nutritional supply. All right, well, here's Hereford cows, which gave considerably less milk, put her down here uh, for this 100 day period, a little over 500 pounds. And as you increase the energy available to these Hereford cows back in 1990, there at the Meat Animal Research Center, what happened? Well, nothing, right? Nothing happened to their milk production. It didn't change, which tells you that they were already at their genetic capacity down here in a lower environment for nutrition. So where's all this extra energy out here going? What's well, going to their body condition, right? These are probably a set of easy fleshing, 
Hereford cows. Now their calves aren't going to come in as big uh, year after year uh, because of the lower milk production. This is the Gelby breed in, back there in the, the, the 1990s project. And you can see tremendous response, tremendous response to increased energy availability. If you change the environment, you modify the environment to increase nutrition, those Gelby cows are gonna respond. On the other hand, if you restrict the environment, you have a real serious drought year, for example, or you overgraze the pastures, for example, or you don't supplement a fall calving cow, for example, you're gonna wind up with near the same milk production as those Angus cows, right? And so finally, the last project I've got here is Courtney Spencer's data uh, from 2017, where we milked that same cow herd I just showed you, uh, the 30 pound at peak lactation cow herd that I inherited. Notice how they responded to increase energy intake. Much more recent genetics in terms of Angus, they responded a great deal uh, more aggressively than the 1990 Angus cows did at the Meat Animal Research Center. And so I'm just telling you that we've created cattle that will definitely respond to increase or artificial modification of the environment, no doubt about it. But at the same time, you've got an animal here which, with greater genetic capacity for output. And let's just say your fescue environment in Tennessee, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna uh, pull a number out of, the, out of the air here and say that it's right somewhere in here. Maybe it's here. But you've got this capacity of the environment. Why would you want to have an animal with the genetic capacity to produce this when they can't get there, right? It'd be a little bit like me driving a maybe a Peterbilt to my office every morning, and all I'm all I'm packing is my briefcase. It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Lots of power there that I don't need. Okay, same story. This is Dr. Mike Brown's data uh, from the USDA station here in Oklahoma. This is, uh, these are Brangus cows, and there's a wide range in milk EPD here. Minus six in the Brangus breed, up to plus 12 in the Brangus breed. Don't worry about all these months, uh, these lines, not too interested in that. This is their 24 hour milk production, which again, Dr. Brown measured with a milking machine. Okay, and as you can see, the higher the genetic potential for milk went, the higher the milk production was every month until you got somewhere in this four, five, six pounds of milk EPD range. And then, then it topped out, right? After that, you got no more milk production, even though you had the genetic capacity. Well, why? Well, it's because those cows are turned out on beautiful, native rangeland pastures down there around El Reno. Tremendous native range pastures, never overgrazed. That's just all that native pasture can produce through these cows in terms of milk production. The environment is limiting the, the production, the milk production in those really high uh, genetic uh, milk females. So that, you know, that to me, this is, I like to use the terminology of something like having a little bit like driving the Peterbilt to work out here, but also having a, a factory with a much higher overhead, but at the same time, not producing any more widgets, right? Who would like to have a factory like that? Okay, just a few more comments here, Justin, then we'll be ready to wrap it up and get to the questions and answers. Uh, things that I'm just, I'm just going to tell you about some of the stuff we're doing here. A lot of it, maybe we, we're not able to apply just yet. Uh, but, uh, uh, we're, uh, I think Courtney said you all just got some of these, some of these individual feed intake units. We've, uh, built some baskets on ours so we can actually measure directly measure hay intake and a lot of cows individually at the same time. That's led to kind of some cool stuff. I don't know if this will blow us up or not. I'm gonna try to show you a video. Justin, cross your fingers. This is the way we fill our baskets. Nope, it flipped to the next slide. Never mind. Okay, anyway, uh, we've done it several ways. These are our cows and individual pens. The grad students uh, 
they're never happy with Dr. Lawman. They get assigned a project like this because they pack that hay out there uh, twice a day and measure orts twice a day and all these cows. But uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to measure inputs. Uh, the outputs aren't too difficult to measure beef cows. The inputs, they're a challenge. All right, Justin, to start our Q&A session here, I'm going to show you three cows. Um, notice uh, that there are two three-year-olds and one seven-year-old. This is a set of Angus cows that we've been, we've been studying here for about two years now. These two three-year-olds, they weigh about 1360 to 1390. Notice the seven-year-old, you'd expect her to be a little heavier, and she is. These are all big cows, right? These two three-year-olds are going to get every bit as big as the seven-year-old eventually, and you know, may, they may just pass her in weight. They're, they're big cows. Uh, peak milk production, which we measure every 30 days, uh, but peak lactation in this three-year-old is only 16 pounds, 33 pounds in this three-year-old. And by the way, 33 pounds of milk in a three-year-old is a lot of milk. Uh, and then the seven-year-old produces 31 pounds on average at peak lactation. Body condition score at weaning in these cows, at least for this particular year, 5.8, 4.4, 5.5. Dry matter intake, so this is uh, two studies per year, once during uh, lactation, uh, about 65, 70 days, and once during gestation. Okay, and we average the two to estimate average annual forage intake. Uh, then here you see the average 205 day calf weaning weight at 547, uh, 608, 601. So certainly the cow with lower milk production in this study did wean a little bit lighter, lighter calf. These two cows are weaning, you know, calves over 600. A commercial operation, uh, at least here in Oklahoma, that would be uh, considered to be pretty good. So. Question to you all, uh, they're uh, viewing this, wh which one of those is the efficient cow? And maybe there's more than one. And, and which one would you rather not own, right? Uh, so Justin, with that, I think I'll just go ahead and, and open it up to, uh, to questions. You bet. And uh, we'll see if uh, some folks put in the chat box who they think the efficient cow is there. Um, so we'll start the, the discussion here by um, me saying, I, as a reproductive physiologist, I'd be I'd need one more piece of data. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> which one's pregnant and which, yeah. which ones aren't. But um, no. You'll have to assume they're all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something, and this is why I was so excited about uh, just, the, you know, hearing you talk about this and thinking through it tonight, because it's, it's something, and I think you set the, straight, the stage great by talking about the difference in profitability, high and low profitability, uh, being on the cost side. And like on that dry matter um, intake, I'd be thinking, you know, want to try to extrapolate that out into pounds of hay or even, you know, if I knew the size of my, my round bales, how many bales of hay difference is that? We can get there pretty quick. Right. So in the uh, and that's the problem. I mean, I'm, this may be uh, more academic milk. You know, the important number is over here, probably in terms of weaning weight. But this one is really important, and people just don't ever get to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the challenge. People don't get to measure this. That's why yeah. we've got those fancy feeders, and we're trying to dig into this topic a little more. Because I'll just I'll just go ahead and and say, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, if you've got you know, if you've got a, th uh, let's say you've got a ranch, we'd all like to have a ranch that could run a thousand of these 6039s, right? And probably the industry has produced a lot of these over the last 25, 30 years, because we've been aiming, like you all suggested, you would like to improve this too. We've been aiming for this number right here. And if you don't know what's going on here or have genetic tools to control this, you know, if you had a ranch that could run a thousand of these and not overgraze it, just think you could, that same ranch could run more than 2000 of these, right? And nearly, nearly, uh, probably not quite, but nearly 2000 of the 2515 cows. I mean, that that's incredible. And again, this is another one of my maybe Wallman's extreme examples, but 
uh, uh, kind of shows you the potential, I think. Right. And that's a lot of calves. I mean, even if it, you know, the logistics didn't work out where it was literally twice as many, you, half again as many, that's yeah. still a lot of calves. Big number. It's yeah. a big number because your cost is, is going to go up some because you have to have more bulls and that kind of thing. But, but really the cost to run the cows is not going to be uh, any different or much different. Right. That's neat. And um, I'm going to take a little bit of moderator privilege with the, the first question and ask you one I was thinking about. And I, I think, I can't remember if, I, if you and I have talked about this before, but on uh, measuring milk, um, have you done much or seen uh, much in literature on uh, milk composition? Uh, you know, just the, yeah, I'm thinking butterfat, right. if we're talking dairy. Yeah, uh, not, not a lot. We, we do it every time we milk. Uh, we hope to have more information on that in in the next uh, couple of years. Um, when we measure cow efficiency, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, what we do is we multiply the milk yield times the milk energy. Mm. And of course, fat is a huge part of the milk energy. We've got some cows that average about 3% butter fat. We've got one cow that averages nine percent butter fat that's pretty cool and she doesn't have to give a whole lot of milk to make a lot of energy for her calf so there's a few publications out there on it really not very many and i think it's uh, bottom line is it's something that's not very well understood yet dr mike brown the same gentleman i mentioned just a few minutes ago has got one neat data set where he shows, let's see if I can get this right, he shows that there are three fatty acids in milk that explains something like a third of the variation in weaning weights. Mm. That's an incredible <laughs> number. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's better than genomics. <laughs> I mean, that's, yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, but it's is. not very much known about it. So it's a good, good question. Someone um, kind of switch over here to the the questions that have been in the Q and A, and and I've answered a few of them. Just a handful of, of uh, some kind of setting the, the stage, basic questions. I did leave one to, to this end, but uh, thinking about uh, weaning age and uh, maybe some of your data on, on weaning weights. Uh, I wonder if weaning age uh, might actually explain some of that in, in the, the Southeast or, or in some of the regions that had some place, some area to improve. Yeah, so in other words, if they're not adjusted weights with the superior data or not, that's a hundred head of calves uh, when they got on the truck, right? So that you can't, obviously that's not, individual animal adjusted weights at 205 days of age it's just not and if people are gradually weaning their calves later and later in the south that number could be could be going up so we looked into that question in that superior data set in fact if you go look up that paper in the journal of applied animal science you'll see the graphs uh, for for it wasn't weaning age. Well, I don't know if it was or not. I guess it was because it was sale date, right? And so we tracked sale date over time over those same years in those different regions. And, there, and bottom line is there was no change over about a 20-year period in sale date. So we think we took that out of the equation. And so there, there's not, there may be some little changes in weaning date, but nothing that would explain that dramatic increase in calf weights in the South. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's that probably controlled for that. So uh, likely some other, other factors there. Yeah. I'm going to read, uh, directly read a question to you. I thought it was interesting you know, when it first came in. It says, uh, in your estimation or experience, what percentage of cows in the nation's cow herd can satisfy um, all the points in the, that list of criteria that you really set the stage with? Wow. Um, 12 calves, 14 years, 365 day interval. Yeah. What percent? I mean, it would be very low. Uh, I, I don't know. And what that well, tells me one, is. Go ahead. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I think it might have slowed down. I lost your audio for a second, but I was just going to say that tells me if there aren't a lot of them, there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, exactly. And and that was the high bar, obviously the really high bar. But uh, yeah, I I don't even know if it would be 1%. Dr. Reinhardt, what do you think it would be? I, I would be at that 1% with you if that. There's not a tremendous amount of them that, that we see that are even, you know, 12 or 14 years old. Yeah. Um, let's see. There was another one in here. I need to scroll down and try to find it. Um, so uh, there have been some recent talk about tracking smaller cows that produce larger calves. So this kind of goes back, uh, you know, to the percentage um, body weight. And you, you talked about this a little bit after the question was put in. Um, do you, do you have um, or is there a way to gather maybe not as complete a data set but you know thinking about the, the weaning weight data sets would there be a way to look back at those uh, spa data and all the other uh, um, data sets that you have there and look at that over that big array of cows uh, you know some of those same questions as it but as it pertains to um, percent body cow body weight of weaning so we, we, we've got some of our own data we've, we've collected here in, in, on Oklahoma commercial operations. Uh, and I mean, it basically says the same thing that everybody else's does. Uh, and that is that the percentage of calf weight to cow weight is always higher in the smaller cows. Okay, the, the bigger the cow average gets, the lower the percentage is in people's herd. So if you've got 100 cows and you've got 20 big cows and 20 little cows, the 20 little cows are going to win. The, the ratio race, they're just going to win. Now, so people, people say, well, why don't we just use that as a selection criteria? I suggested maybe it's a good, it is a good culling tool. And I, I don't have a problem with using it as a selection tool uh, but yeah, look, too much of a problem, but there's, there is one publication that shows, you know, if you think about it, if you always select for the cow with the highest ratio, what you're really doing is on average, you're selecting for little thin cows that give a lot of milk, might not breed back every year, Dr. Reinhardt, or maybe, maybe breed back late. I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing that in there, but smaller, thin cows, right? If she's body condition score three, she's going to be lighter and her ratio is going to look really good. That's why I encourage people to, if they're going to use ratios, adjust your cow weights to body condition score five. Otherwise you're not comparing apples to apple. The little skinny cow is going to win. Okay, and you, and you don't want to be selecting for them because in this one uh, publication I'm trying to tell you about, uh, what they discovered is that the high ratio of cows gave more milk and guess what? Ate more feed, okay, or forage, which is exactly what you started out <laughs> trying to avoid with that ratio, raise bigger calves with a lower cost. Uh, so that's why I think it's important to maybe use it as a culling tool, but don't get too carried away with it. Right. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, it did. And then that, you know, that kind of always gets back to something I think about, about fitting cows to environment. Uh, you know, I got, as a repro guy, I say, well, all you have to do is preg check them and cull the open ones and they'll end up fitting your environment, but it's not necessarily that easy, right? I mean, you still have to have the production goals in mind and, and it's all on a spectrum and, you yeah. go too far one way or the other on any of this and it, it doesn't hold true all the way to the end of the spectrum. Yeah, I'd, you'd, you'd rather only have to cull 5% of their open. If you head off in the wrong direction to get too crazy, you're going to wind up culling 15 or 20% right. every year that don't match. Right. So, so and we're, we're um, actually a little bit past our, our time, but I do want to wrap up with just one kind of a really general uh, question. Uh, it, that would be, do you see anything, um, any major shifts in the industry coming um, as we try to adapt to some of this information? Uh, maybe not even just to this information, but 
in general as, as things change in the industry? Any major shifts in, in what our cows are going to look like? I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the one thing the industry has proven to me is that you give uh, ranchers, uh, cow producers, a, a tool that works and they're willing to use it. And they, and they do. Uh, you know, sometimes we overdo things and that's, we talked about that in terms of, you know, whether it be cow size or milk production or whatever. Uh, but generally the industry comes back to what makes more sense. It might take some time and yes, that's happening now. Uh, it, the Angus of course is the biggest breed in the country go take a look at their genetic trend for milk production. Now I should have showed it to you here tonight. It has, it has begun to stabilize. Now I think it will continue to stay there and maybe, may, maybe it'll even drop a little bit. And you know, my philosophy now, moderate, even, even below breed average milk production is more efficient in most situations. And uh, that's what's going on right now in the Angus breed. So that's a big change, Dr. Reinhardt. And just a few years ago, we looked at the genetic trend in at least in Angus, and it was headed straight north. It's, it's changed. You know, the industry definitely moderated uh, frame size. Um, uh, whether or not we get beyond this continual selection for growth and creating these huge carcasses, you know, I, I don't know. I would think at some point we would max out there too. What, what do you think? Yeah, and I think our limitations on marketing the actual product, there's only so far we can go with that. You know, um, already seeing studies on, um, on car on ribeye area and how that affects marketing, those kinds of things. So more and more concern about portion size showing up. Yep. Right. You know, but all this does, I started off talking about uh, the, the sport of U.S. Roundtable and, um, you know, Golden State Foods and Nestle partners in that that, that uh, they provided to, to support this webinar series. What you've talked about tonight is explicitly about sustainability. You know, even if we don't use that word a lot, I mean, exactly what you're saying is economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, which it all wraps up together with yep. generational, the whole thing. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. I know we're getting past time here, but you know, if you, you just think about the three cows, if you could run even 50% more cows, and my examples suggested that among those three cows, you could run twice for the same cost, basically, or, or at least the same grazing resource. How about that? It would be half the cost per cow. You can run twice the amount of cows, and that's what you'd call a sustainable intensification of beef cattle production. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's, that's a really good way to, to wrap it up here. And, and last thing I'll say is, uh, Dr. Longman, just thank you again very much for being willing to put this together and spend time with, with us here in, in Tennessee and uh, a tremendous amount of information to think about it and uh, to to how it can apply to us in, in all our different situations. So again, I just really appreciate your time. Absolutely, and I, I'm sorry we didn't, I know I could just see the numbers of questions coming. I wish we could have gotten every one of them. I'd just love to visit with you about them. And uh, I mean, don't be afraid to email or, or call or uh, prod Dr. Reinhardt to, to invite me over sometime. Absolutely. We'll absolutely do that. Yeah. And that's always the thing on here. There's so many good questions. It's hard to, but Courtney and I actually talked about having a couple of just panel discussions in here. Yeah, that's tremendous that your folks are willing to contribute like that. That's great. All right, Courtney, is there anything else we need to, to think about or anything I haven't mentioned? Um, all good, but I'll just reiterate that if you don't see the survey as soon as we end the meeting, you'll get it tomorrow night about 5.30 p.m. So, um, and if something happens and you don't have it by 5.30 p.m., email your a &R agent and they can get it to you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lohman. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Have a good, right. good night. Hey, have a great spring. Thanks, Dave. See you.